uh, I was invited by Jeannie to come down to the jam and uh, I'd heard about it but um, I'd never been and then uh, when I got here I found that I knew most if not all of the fellas and so it was uh, it's it's somewhere musical but so relaxing the, the situation because nothing is arranged nothing we, we don't know what tunes coming up until it comes up somebody suggests it I think you may have overheard this morning uh, Ronnie the piano player said okay Gary what do you want to do well actually uh, he chose the first one because it was something they were already doing uh, secret love and I just fancied it and so I sang along while they were playing and found it was in my key and suggested to him that I join him for the last chorus. So that's how that one came up. But that's extraordinary. Ordinarily, it get, they get chosen the moment they get chosen. So it's very free form. What's it like uh, during the daytime in Las Vegas for, for performers and entertainers and musicians? How do you mean, from a point of view of a place to live? Well, I mean, uh, the, the the entertainer's culture. What's the entertainer culture like? I think that depends on the stage of your life and whether you've been here a long time or not. I've been here a very long time. I've lived here. And so I have, a, you know, home and my, my son lives here. He's grown and uh, he lives across the other side of town. So I will say this. I find it very understanding as a place to live because no matter what stage you're in and so no matter what your requirements are it's a very um, adjusting city to, to your needs there's everything here that you need and it's of course grown incredibly incredibly when I came to town it was if you can believe it 110,000 people and it's now nearly 2 million I think for a number of years just recently it was the fastest growing city in the country. Right, yeah. Then of course the terrible, terrible recession hit and I think it slowed down the influx of people. What about the uh, the economics of live performing? H how has that affected your work? <sighs> well, um, is it economics or is it uh, trends in popular music where that very much so, especially in the upper brackets. I'm not in the upper bracket, so it doesn't really affect me. I pick and choose where and where where and when I want to sing, and um, uh, it's a part of my life. So uh, it's very necessary for me still to do it. So that affects my demands, if there are any. And having said that, I'm it suddenly occurs to me that most of my demands these days would be as to facilities and circumstances. In other words, uh, it's like a piano player with uh, asked to play an evening on a piano that's badly out of tune. Most piano players I know would turn it down and say it's, it's not worth it, uh, you know, unless somebody offered you an enormous amount of money. But, but the facilities and the circumstances are, are very important, I think. And when you play uh, in a, a, a production show like you have, for example, mm -hmm. which, which shows? Um, I was the original leading man in the first show at the old MGM. It's now called Bally's. In those days it was called the MGM Grand. And their opening show in the early 70s was called Hallelujah Hollywood. And I was the leading man in that show stayed in it until it closed did I know I left a little bit before it closed um, and then they opened a second show in 81 after the terrible fire at the MGM Grand which took so many lives terrible terrible tragedy we were three night three weeks away from opening night when that happened all, all the costumes went up but of course that was incidental to the terrible loss of life and I was the leading man in that show and so I was there from the early 70s and on and off until the mid 80s and um, that is six nights a week two shows a night so you design your life your home life around the demands of the show because a big consideration doing a show like that is the same as it is on Broadway they want you there they don't want <coughs> I can't 
because I've got... <laughs> You'd last five minutes because uh, your reputation would get around as unreliable and they wouldn't offer you a job. I mean, they want you to be able to sing and look decent in the clothes, but you've got to be there twice a night, six nights a week. And so as a creative performer, as a creative artist, as a, as a singer yourself, outside of the show, where would the uh, musicians and singers, where would they go to, uh, to, uh, to, stretch, to stretch creatively? Yes, very good question. There are a number of rooms around town, clubs, restaurants, that encourage what's known in the trade as sitting in. In other words, if it's me, I just show up with this. If I'm a saxophone player, I show up with my axe, as the musicians say, in my case, and uh, almost as soon as you walk through the door, say, Charlie, hey, come on, come on. And before you know it, you're singing or playing or whatever. There are any, any number of rooms in town that, especially in these difficult times, look to that as a source of keeping people amused late at night, and it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, glass of wine or whatever, depending on the room you're in. But uh, typically, if someone were to sit in, don't they have uh, just maybe they let one musician sit in with the, with the main band at a time or one singer? Depends on the circumstances, Scott, and the number of players who are already there working. But most of the time in those kind of rooms, you're talking about the basic rhythm section a keyboard, a bass player, and a drummer. In some instances, maybe just a keyboard and a drummer. So they welcome other players. And they usually know them, they're friends, acquaintances, fellow workers in a band, so they're, they're always welcome. And in a long evening, three, four hours, it's a welcome relief to have somebody come in and take away the the musical burden for a moment and you're just playing along while he or she are, you know it's the main the main attraction or the main thrust how common is it uh, to have uh, an organized rehearsal band like this if that's what uh, when i say rehearsal band just a place to play well um i don't know this is this is strictly uh, strictly a jam um meaning um Nobody gets paid, anybody can choose a tune, but they've got to be, what's the word I want? It's not homo homogenous, they've got to be uh, somebody who fits in easily and doesn't cause problems. These guys have all been friends for a very long time. And like I say, when I first came here, I found that I knew most of them. And those that I didn't know immediately became friends and, and, and were sympathetic. And um, it's very good of them to let uh, a singer or two singers sit in for part of the jam, which is two hours. Um, I'm not sure that I know of another jam situation in the city that meets during the day on a regular basis. Now, these clubs that I was talking about late at night after the regular job mm. is finished mm. and you don't want to go home, you want to let the adrenaline come and see you go where, somewhere where you know they're sitting in. Um, those certainly abound all over the city, but I don't know of a daytime organized jam where as soon as you've been here two or three weeks, there's an implicit, unspoken responsibility to be here, which everybody takes seriously because they love being here. I mean, this is what they can play anything in any style, and they're all wonderful players. I mean, wonderful players. So what's it like for you as a singer? I mean, is it a place that, that you come to, you know, in a way to... Uh... Well, I'll frequently try out new ideas. And most of the time, what Ronnie or the piano player or Ronnie Simone or somebody else will choose is usually a tune I either know or I would like to work on. But there have been occasions when um, I will bring something that I've been gestating as it were but at home thinking really like to do that now as a matter of fact I have a job at the end of this month and I'm just having a new arrangement written that I've that I've uh, uh, undertaken to to get done that I need for that job and when when the arranger has finished putting it to paper and we've run it down he and I just to see if it's it 
it works, I'll bring it here before I go out and do it at the job. I've already had that thought and said, oh, I'm going to find out, you know, if this chart works. How does it feel to sing with this band, knowing that it's really all, I mean, you know, typically uh, impromptu, as opposed to an arrangement or a, a production number that you're doing every night, every week? I can't. I've been coming here, I think, a couple of years, I told you, and I think that's right. I can't think of an occasion, not one, when I started to sing a tune with them and the wheels came off, as we say. I can't think of one. It's like, I mean, I'm very careful. I know what key, musical key I do a tune in before I start. And I always check it with Ronnie to make sure. And he'll sometimes say, nah, why don't we try it a little higher up than that? For your voice, I think it would be better. And, and he's such a wonderful judge and has had so many years experience. I defer to him, but I don't, I don't pick a tune to sing and suggest it to him without I know the ground that I'm covering. And he'll say to me, how do you want to do it? Count off a tempo, and I'll count off a tempo. And first time, Scott, it's perfect. All the eight guys, it's perfect. They're, they're studio quality players. Oh, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. They give you the feel that you ask for. That's why he most of the time says to me, how do you, well, always he says now, how do you want to do it? Well, let's do it as a ballad, or let's do it about here. One, two, three. And the rhythm section, as I count, one, two, three, the rhythm section's already playing. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. The musicians have an expression for it. It's like getting into a warm bed with these guys. That's exactly what it feels like. There are no sharp edges, no sharp edges at all. And they, I think, are all, at a certain level, I think they're all conscious of that because there's mutual respect and there's good manners and it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. You've, uh, you've been a stage singer, not just uh, a, a, a studio singer, but a stage singer uh, at Broadway? Yes, yes. I did four years. Actually, it was the national tour. It didn't tour at all. It sat down in Los Angeles at the Music Center. I was in Phantom there for four years. Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, yeah. Opened um, in the May of 89 and did four years until it closed in 93. Incredible experience, incredible experience. Did you uh, play several roles? I played three. The theater manager and understudied another one of the theater managers and then two other characters. And uh, uh, incredible. And I also did a national tour of 42nd Street for a year and a half, all over the country. 84 cities in 18 months what they call in the business a bus and truck, with all its scenery in, in, in uh, semis, uh, semis, as you say, mm -hmm. um, trailing along after us. You call lorries? <laughs> Very good, Scott. <laughs> Very good. I've been, on the, been to the West End. So. Very good. Yeah. So, um, and I also, um, I also understudied, well, not understudied, technically I was a standby for the lead on Broadway in La Cage Fall, and never got on to the stage. The guy was never ill. I had a little wax doll with pins in my apartment. <laughs> Nothing worked. No, I'm kidding. He was a friend of mine, very good in the part. You got paid anyway. I got paid anyway. Yeah. It's a really weird situation. Contractually, you have to be no more than five minutes from the theater physically every night that the play is on can't be more than five minutes away in, in Manhattan at half hour, which as you know is 35 minutes before the curtain. Mm. Because if something goes wrong, somebody gets to the theater feeling fine and then suddenly blah, or whatever, they can pick you up and say, Gary, get here. Absolutely, absolutely terrifying experience because all the dialogue in Lacage between the two main characters, I stood by for the, for the quote, male half of the, the Jean Barry role, Georges. All of the conversations were lightning speed. Most of them were comic. So you had to be bit, 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 bit on the lines. The only way I could do it was to do the play with another person reading 
and, and stand up and do it every night in my apartment. It's the only way I could keep up the speed. Because the one thing you mustn't do if you're a standby or an understudy, when you get to go on for, in somebody's place, say you're the star and you get sick, I go on for you, and you're working with a partner in most of the scenes, the one thing you must not do is be so different I must not be so different from you that that other person has to adjust because the play falls apart. You know, we put such an emphasis now with Glee on television, which is nice because it, it puts some emphasis uh, back uh, on live performing in schools, um, on the arts, arts education, music education, acting or drama. What do you see as, as uh, the future for acting or singing as a career would you encourage a young person to go and and major in dramatic arts anymore given the, the the current state or the evolution of media yes i would but isn't there always a but i would want to make sure that i had a long enough conversation with that young person to be certain that they understood just three or four absolutely unbreakable rules going in. One of which is, for instance, you have to be physically in the right cities in the country to get the training and the exposure in those fields. It's no use living in, oh, name it, Missouri or yeah. Wisconsin. You can't get the training that you need in those very important years from say mid-teenage to mid or late twenties when the die is cast and you get all the habits of discipline and rehearsal and being places on time that you need to survive in our business because as you know living where you do our business is I mean absolutely cutthroat in the in the sense that it expects certain standards of behavior and you can't learn those when you're 34 it's too late too late probably by 14 or 16 years but there are colleges and universities with dramatic arts programs and uh, and teaching i guess i guess what i'm asking is how do you view uh, the profession of singing or, or live performing now in the 21st century would you encourage young people to pursue it as a as a vocation well, there are two, there's one very major uh, uh, um, dividing line. You're talking, I think you're talking, le legitimate theater and musical theater as opposed to um, no, and also, popular also music. Pop music, uh, you know, live, you, live performing of any kind, even in, including uh, films, film and television. I mean, uh, having had a, uh, you've been able to s support yourself really as a performing uh, artist, but uh, aren't you in the top 10% really of, of, of all the actors or singers? Maybe, maybe that's being a little bit generous to me, but if you're saying to me, if one of your uh, unmentioned questions is, what does it depend on? I would have one word for you. It depends on your own idea, if you're a young person, your own idea of discipline because in all the areas that you've mentioned that are not rock and pop and even and 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 uh, rap and uh, and even they have their own disciplines they don't have the traditional disciplines but they have disciplines there are certain things you can't do to yourself during the day if you've got a concert tonight where you're going to sing for two and a half hours like a lot of these very important big rockers do and, 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 and rappers I mean they learn that they can't because you read about their misfortunes in the paper can't had a concert showed up two hours late couldn't sing had to leave everybody's angry well you don't even get to do that once in the legitimate theater. If you, in, in Phantom, for instance, in LA, we had at least two assistant stage managers out front in the audience during every performance. If you altered anything or didn't do something exactly the way it was rehearsed, after the performance came down, the curtain came down, and you were backstage in our dressing room, you got a visit from that stage manager who gave you one of these. Could I have a word with you? Why did you do that 
the way it's not rehearsed. Oh, oh well, I, I, I'm sorry, I did. Well, please don't do that again, because the next time you do it, it'll be a fine, and the time after that, you'll be suspended. Act as equity rules. You've got to have some uh, flaw. You've got to have some, you know. Yeah. Standard. Standards. For enforcing. So if you said, what's the most important thing for a young person? You need a conversation with them to determine as best you can whether they have this sense of inbuilt disciplines. Because if they have it, there's a very good chance they could make a nice living. And if they don't... Are you, are, you, are you still performing, would you say? Are you performing live? or? Yes, I am. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to do a show on the 26th here in town at a, a daytime show, a two o'clock in the afternoon show. And um, it's a big opportunity for me because I haven't been working a lot recently. Uh, my wife passed away and uh, it was a whole thing I got. I didn't want to work and I was depressed and all of yeah. that. Yeah. I, I don't mean clinically, but it was very, very tough to, to meet those disciplines again and to say, I don't care about all this, I've got to go. Um, one of the last things she said to me was, I want you to make sure you promise me now that you're going to keep going. And um, um, she was talking in the round, but I know she, she meant to include my work. So this is a wonderful opportunity for me. I'm very excited about it. What's the show? It's a show called Toast of the Town. It happens on both sides of town s simultaneously. Uh, are you aware of the two sides of town thing about Las Vegas? Well, maybe the viewers uh, would benefit from your explaining. Interstate 15 that runs from Los Angeles to Salt Lake City mm -hmm. runs like an artery right through the middle of its town. Divides this, 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 the city of Las Vegas into from the two. West, from the west side, from the east side. Oh. We're now standing on the east side of town. and. Um, this show is produced by this production company simultaneously on a Thursday afternoon at two o'clock in two hotel casinos. The Sun Coast on the west side of town and Sam's Town, which we can probably well, not quite see, but it's just over there through those trees. Um, and uh, I did, I did a, a show for them about five or six weeks ago at their east side location. and. Uh, showed them my DVD after I had performed for them and they liked it and mm -hmm. I wanted to try something different and they said okay let's think about it and about a week later they said okay in January we would like you to do a show for us at the Sun Coast and we'd like you to host the show and do that thing that you want to do because we've been looking for something different so this is a huge opportunity. For what them. is that thing? I play games with the audience and I give them prizes which is very, very um, common in England. A music hall style? Music hall style, and there's an interchange. My game is, uh, my game is uh, uh, songs from old movies. I sing a, a bit of a part of a song, and the first person up mm -hmm. to the stage or in front of the stage uh, who can tell me what movie it's from wins a prize. And they thought that was wonderful because they've been doing this show for some time, and. They were looking for a different format. Now, whether that's going to be it or not, I don't know. But I'm taking it seriously, and I'm giving it every effort. So wish me luck, Scott. When's it, uh, when, uh, have they booked it through? No, no, no. This is simply, this is a one-shot oh, one test. Oh, oh, oh. And then we're all going to look at the videotape and see what we think. But is it open to the public? Oh, sure. There'll be a huge audience there. They do, they do this show every Thursday at 2 o'clock at the Sun Coast. They have a huge crowd. They start lining up at 12.30. And between East and West, will you be at the Sun Coast or Samstown? I'll be at Sun Coast. I've done Samstown, hoping to do it again. But the Sun Coast is a very, very lovely little old-fashioned Vegas showroom with booths and different levels of the audience. The audience is uh, raked. Do you remember English music hall uh, style performancing? Oh, it's what I grew up on. My grandmother and my grandfather, there was always singing in the house. My mother, it was in the days when every family had a piano player and my mother, the eldest child of five, was the piano player in the house and there was always a, a, a big heap of music on the piano. And I used to scuffle around among the piano, uh, pieces of music and try to make sense of it. So yes, and, and, they, and my grandmother especially brought me up with that. I know songs 
I mean, I'm a singer by profession now, so I'm constantly learning new material. But I have a bunch of songs in my brain that I never consciously learned. And I've thought about it over the years, and they were all songs that my grandmother taught me. Very, I mean, I'm talking turn of the century, uh, 18th into 19th, and ni excuse me, 19th into 20th century, I'm not quite that old, 19th and 20th century, turn of the century music hall music from London. Could you give us an example? Um, Does anything come to mind? My old man said, follow the van and don't dilly dally on the way. Off went the van with my old man in it. I followed on with my old cock in it. But I dillied and dallied and dallied and dillied and lost my way and don't know where to go. That's typical of that, that kind of bright, cheerful too. Um -cha, um -cha, um -cha. And as a matter of fact, it's funny, it didn't happen today when you were in there with the camera because Ronnie, Simone, our piano player, he must know almost every tune ever written. He knows a lot of those old-time English uh, uh, music ones. He's always egging me on to sing one. And of course, excuse me just a moment. I don't want those to blow away. Um, um, the song from My Fair Lady, a uh, very famous, very successful song in My Fair Lady, Get Me to the Church on Time, yeah. is based on those old English music halls. Mm -hmm. I'm getting married in the morning. There's that, that famous two kind of two-step rhythm. There was a time in the 60s, My Fair Lady is an example, when, when uh, Hollywood distributed, or I, I suppose the films were made at uh, Pinewood and Boreham uh, uh, English, you know, England. English made, well... I think a lot of people do now that you know the internet makes a, a, sure. knowledge accessible. Sure. Um, uh, it's, and so, you know, British movies had well, I mean, like like British culture, you know, traveled the world. I mean, India. I mean, th throughout the English-speaking world. Um, did you perform in any of those movies? Uh, let me see. I did a television series at Shepperton. Uh, in the 60s that was for ABC over here. It was for Screen Gems called The Ugliest Girl in Town. I was the older of two brothers and the younger brother got into a, a scrape of some kind and had to dress in girls' clothing for an extended period. <laughs> the young Canadian actor who was cast in that role for the series was a very, very serious, committed well-educated actor. He hated playing in drag. Oh, oh. <laughs> hated it. And I was kind of one of his comic foils as the older brother. We did that at Shepperton. Movies, movies. I don't think... Uh, did, you I, work, did you work with Robert Goulet? I knew him, God rest his soul, quite well. Um, was he a good singer? Oh. Make your hair stand up on end. Wonderful, wonderful voice wonderful voice and did he perform in Camelot did, did, on Broadway on Broadway he played he played Lancelot on Broadway did, did you play in Camelot anywhere I was in the movie oh yes what year was that 1967 and I had a contract you won't believe this but it's true I had a contract to play one of the three principal nights I played Tuesday night. No, that's a terrible joke. I, didn't play. I played Sir oh, Lionel. I played Sir Lionel. Um, I had a contract for a year. This was the contract I signed before I went to work. I had a contract for a year that guaranteed me what they called 10 days of principal photography, which is the technical trade term for appearing on camera um, with lines or singing or whatever and I spent a year mostly playing golf at Griffith Park <laughs> no that's, that's not true but it almost is in fact there was one occasion when I was out playing golf at Griffith Park I had to check in at the studio every day of course to make sure that I wasn't needed and normally they tell you the previous afternoon we don't need you tomorrow Gary you're off um, or we need you to come in and your call is 8.30 or whatever it was. But one day I was playing golf at Griffith Park, literally, and here across the, the greens and the fairways of the golf course comes a golf cart tearing across the 
the green sword, and it's an assistant director. Okay, Gary, we need you in two hours. Luckily, the studio was only five minutes away. We were shooting at Burbank. And so I jumped in the car and went to work. But did Camelot, yes, Sir Lionel. Great, great experience. Sir Lionel. Lionel. There, there were three principal knights in the story, Sir Sagramore, Sir Dinadon, and Sir Lionel, and I played Sir Lionel. He gets unseated in the jousts by, by uh, Lancelot, played by Franco Nero. And um, that was very interesting. Worked with dear, dear Vanessa Redgrave, and Richard Harris, and Lionel Jeffries. Oh, what a cast. What a cast. What were they like uh, off camera? Were they, were they decent to the other players? Respectful? I mean, uh, were they haughty? Do you know, Scott, I found this without exception in my, in my long and varied career. People in positions of, what do you want to call it, um, prominence in a movie or a play, unwaveringly are respectful. I did a, I did a, a tiny bit in a Coen Brothers movie here, um, what, seven or eight years ago, called Intolerable Cruelty. And my only scene was with George Clooney. Im imagine this, you're going to do a day on a movie, and your scene is with George Clooney and Catherine Zeta-Jones, just the three of you. Everybody on that set was unfailingly polite, respectful, pleasant. And, and, and it was the same thing in Camelot. It was um, mostly English actors. In fact, I congratulated whoever it was, the producer at the time, because in all the principal roles, they cast English-speaking, English-English-speaking actors. Mm -hmm. And so it was just wonderful, just wonderful. How did it affect your career? I don't know that it did, actually, very much. Um, it's still something to talk about now, and I certainly will be mentioning it on, uh, on the 26th to my audience, because one of the games that I play, as I told you, is identifying songs from movies. Mm -hmm. And one of the songs I'm going to sing is, If Ever I Would Leave You. And when somebody comes up and wins the prize, I'm casually going to say to them as they're standing at the microphone, I was in that movie. Just let things happen if they happen. Most probably the audience will go, oh, but they may not. Have you ever sung a song? Have you, just point it towards me. Have you ever sung a song where, where you choked up? Are you teared up in the, in the middle of a song? I mean, oh, yes. personalizing it? Oh, yes. Not supposed to, but sometimes um, on the spur of the moment, especially if it's an unplanned thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any particular songs that, that would, would give you a, a hard time? I, I, mean, I can imagine that. Actually, actually, that particular song would. For a very private and personal reason that I won't go into. I'll tell you about it after you switch that thing off. Was uh, If I Rule the World from Camelot? No, that's from a, um, that's from an English um, musical Lewis? called, called Pickwick. A wonderful English comic who had a glorious, glorious tenor voice. Harry Seacombe did it on Broadway, won the Tony for it. And, um, one of the best recordings I ever heard of that song was somebody you mentioned a few minutes ago, Bob Goulet. Gorgeous recording. Because he had, you know, he had the voice for it. The resonance is lovely. It's a favorite song of mine, I must say. But today was joyful. Today? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, wonderful. I couldn't believe it when they started playing uh, Secret Love, the song from... Uh, Calamity Jane, the Doris Day movie. Oh, incidentally, did you read in the paper? She's putting out a new album. Doris She's Day. 90. She's 90. And they're just reissuing an album. I think, I think that's wonderful. And all the proceeds go to her uh, animal preservation oh, that's great. thing. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Anyway, um, 
the guys were playing um, a very jazzy swinging version of Secret Love. Yeah. And so I'm singing along while they're playing just to get myself into the feel of the room, the acoustics all around, getting myself settled down. And I'm singing all the way through and it's in my key, meaning I can comfortably sing it. Mm -hmm. So I walked over to the piano player, Ronnie, while he was playing and said, can I do the last chorus? He said, absolutely. And uh, it turned out to be very happy and that set the day off. I barely sat down in my chair, I'd just arrived. And um, that set the day off running and sparkling. So that was fun. Are you looking forward to next week already? Oh yeah, good. every Friday. Every Friday is a new adventure and you're among really good friends. It's wonderful. Wonderful.